I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, it is a joy to be with you. And I know that you are also happy to be here. This is our 10th lesson, and it seems like we are winding down. So again, I greet you in Jesus' name. I'm glad to have you on this platform, all the pastors, the leaders, members, those of you on the World Wide Web, just being here with us. We invite you to share this hour with us as we study God's word together. Again, we are in the book of Genesis, and this evening we will be continuing from chapter 19. So let's bow our hearts for prayer as we invite the presence of the Lord here with us. So Father, we thank you once again that you are a faithful God. You are faithful to your word. You said where the twos and the threes are gathered, you are there in the midst, and you are there to bless so we receive that blessing this evening. Let the word of God be a blessing to every heart and to every life. We pray that we will continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. Lord, we pray for the spirit of revelation, Lord, the spirit of understanding and knowledge so that our hearts can be changed and we can, Lord, we can be shaped into your very image. We thank you again in Jesus' name.
Amen. So again, we are looking at chapter 19 of Genesis. So we invite you to please get your Bibles as we are able to follow on. Now we are talking about the life of Abraham. That's where we are at at the moment. And you would remember that God had given to Abraham a promise. And that promise was that he would bless his seed. And he would bless his seed as much as the stars of the sky, if he could ever dare to number it, and the sand of the sea, if he could ever dare to number that. And that's how multiplied Abraham's generation would be. And when God gave Abraham that promise, Abraham believed God, and the Bible tells us it was counted to him for righteousness. Not only that, but God was so well pleased with Abraham that the scripture tells us that Abraham became a friend of God. And so when God was planning to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he had to come to Abraham and let him know what his intention was. As we closed off last week, Lot, which was Abraham's cousin, I'm sorry, his nephew, and his two daughters and his wife, the angels, had to hurry them out of Sodom and Gomorrah because they were about to pour the judgment of God. The Bible tells us that they held their hands and they literally pushed them out of the door and tell them, go as far as you can in the city, actually in the mountains, and do not look back. As we are told in the story, Lot's wife, she looked back for whatever reason. She disobeyed the word of the Lord, the word of the angel. And as a result, she was immediately turned into a pillar of salt. Lot had asked the angel if he can go into a little city that was called Zoar, and he was permitted to go there. The story continues, he did spend some time there with his daughters, but as soon as he could, he became very fearful of staying in that city, and he ran for his life up in the mountains where the angels had originally told him to go to. As the story continues, we are told that he went to the mountains, and it was there that his daughters felt we were not in a position, or we are not in a position to give seed to our father because there's nobody around here. So you know what? Let us create seed for him. And so as a result, the Bible tells us the older spake to the younger and said, you go in unto that tonight and tomorrow night I will go in. And as a result, they will, how we should put it, they 
they were pregnant by their father. They gave him wine to drink. He did not even know what went on. And as a result of that, we have two new people groups. They had this son called Moab and the other son called Ammon. And so they became the Moabites and the Ammonites. And a little bit later, we will see that they also created some problems for the children of Israel. So as we look in our scripture, we will see in chapter 19, where we had the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then as we come to the end of the chapter, we will see where the Bible tells us, then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down and when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger she also bore a son and called his name Benami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. And so our story is now going to continue with Abram. And so let's look at chapter uh, 20 in this particular story. As we look at verse one, we would see, read with me, um, chapter 20, verse one. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shil and stayed in Jira. So what we see is, it could be for some reason when Abraham now looked out in the plains and he saw how Sodom and Gomorrah had been completely destroyed, completely burnt up. He did not stay in the area. And so he moved on and he came to this area as far as Jira. And the Bible tells us here, now Abram said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Jira, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Again, we see that weakness in Abraham, where he is not trusting God as he should, but somehow God in his mercy and in his grace, he still comes through for Abraham. And so what we see happening here is that again, he comes to Abimelech. Now remember, Abimelech is not really a name. You'll remember we came across it before. We come across it again. And we are going to come across it a little bit later with Isaac. Abimelech is actually a title that was given to the kings in those regions. And so here he does the same thing that he did before. But God stepped in again. And in a dream, he spoke to Abimelech. And so Abimelech got upset. Look at verse 6. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. And so God spoke very strongly to Abimelech. And so Abimelech arose that morning. Look at verse 13. It came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever you go. Say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male and female and servants and gave them to Abraham and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. So here Abimelech was disappointed that, that he, you know, Abraham was not truthful to him. And at the same time, he just started blessing, just blessing this man. And here what it tells us in verse 17. So Abraham prayed to God to heal Abimelech, his wife and his female servants. Then they bore children. So Abimelech's wife was immediately, she became barren. Abimelech himself was ill. And so God said, you have a prophet there. That man that came into your house, he is a prophet. And ask him to bless you. And so Abraham prayed and God averted the judgment from Abimelech's family. So as we go on now, we come to chapter 21. And as we look at chapter 21, we would see where 
Isaac is now born. So this chapter tells us about the birth of Isaac. Look at verses 1 to 3. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken for Sarah. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And remember we said Isaac, the meaning of Isaac is laughter. And then the, the, the story goes on and it tells us after Isaac was born, it took a period of time for Isaac to be weaned. Now, when you do the research, you realize weaning is not like in our time in our Caribbean culture. Weaning in this particular culture took about two to three years. So after that two to three year period, after Isaac had been weaned and Abraham is overjoyed and he is, you know, celebrating Isaac. The Bible tells us at this point in time, Ishmael, who is about 14 years of age, he begins to mock Isaac. Look at um, verses, let's pick up from 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and the skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and he sent her away. So as Abraham, as Ishmael mocked Hagar, I'm getting it mixed up, as Ishmael mocked Isaac, the Bible tells us that Sarah was very upset. And when she came to her husband, the Lord spoke and said, whatever Sarah said to do, do. You have to put the child out. And so the child was cast out. And so being cast out, the Bible tells us here that Abraham, all he could have done was taken a little bread, a, a little meal, and give it to the child and give it to the mother, and they were able to send them out. And so in sending them out, the Bible tells us in verse 15, the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy <coughs> excuse, under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. So here she's cast out and she's out there. She's very much alone and she's weeping. And the Bible tells us that again, she has a visitation. And in that visitation, God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called out to her and said to her, what is ailing you, Hagar? What is wrong? And he said to her, do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. So again, we see here, Hagar is visited by the angel of God. Then God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the lad. So God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So we are not going to hear from Ishmael for a very long time. I think the next time we will see him is when they come to bury their father. And so he moves off of the scene because why? He is cast out. The child of the bond woman will not be heir with the child of the free. And so he is cast out. And I want to just take a minute uh, just to show you coming out of uh, Galatians, actually. Uh, let me just see if I can uh, get that chart. Uh, we can put that chart up for you. And as we look at the chart, we will see Hagar, Ishmael, the ordinary way. So Hagar was not according to God's plan. Hagar was according to man's plan. Hagar was according to the flesh. And so Hagar bore Ishmael. But when we look at the other end, we will see Sarah, who bore Isaac, who was the promise of God. He was the one or the child of promise. As we look again, we will see Hagar representing Mount Sinai, which is the law, 
It was earthly and it brought enslavement. Later on, we will see to the Jewish nation. However, God is calling a higher people. He calls them what, to Mount Zion, to a heavenly place, to a place where there is freedom. So the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4 takes some time to explain what happened here when Hagar was cast out. And so the child of promise was now to inherit. And then finally, you will see there was a particular race that came out from Ishmael. And that race was the disinherited race. Not that they were totally disinherited because God blessed the child. But in terms of being heirs to the promise, this was the disinherited race. And as we come into the New Testament, we will see not just a race now, but we will see grace extended to not just one people group, but to all of mankind. Whosoever will, grace is there. And that grace, once we embrace that grace, we now will become heirs of the promise. So I wanted to take time just to show you that. All right. So we want to move on now as we look at chapter 22. Abraham's faith is now confirmed. So let's look at it. the first three verses. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So now we come to what we call this chapter is a pivotal chapter in the book of Genesis. In this chapter, we will see where Abraham had now grown in faith. We kept seeing that progression in Abraham's life. It was not an overnight thing. It was a progression. So even though here and there we will see him failing, as a human being, as a mortal man, you know, he did some wrong things like any one of us would. But at the end of the day, Abraham had a heart towards God. And Abraham, in his growth, God is now going to put him to what we call the ultimate test. Now, one would say, as you look back at Abraham and what he had to do with Ishmael, you would realize that that in itself was a test. Because here, God had given him Ishmael as a son. 14 years had passed that Abraham in his old age had raised this son. So he would have loved this son. He would have been close to this son. And God comes to him and says to him, you have to cast out this son. So here again, God had put Abraham to the test. But if you observe, Abraham had come to a place of total obedience. So even though it would have been painful for him to release Ishmael and he would have thought, well, okay, this is as much as God would do in testing him, it was not over. And I want to take a minute to say to us, you know, sometimes when we are tested in some hard places, we tell ourselves God couldn't do anything harder than this or worse than this, you know, and we feel that we've come to the ultimate but as long as we live in this flesh, God continues to test us and to grow us. And so here he comes to this ultimate test where the only son that he has left, he has no idea what's going on with Ishmael. Ishmael is totally out of the picture. He had to deal with that grief and that pain. But at the same time, he had to keep moving on. And in moving on, God comes to him and he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to sacrifice that son. And the scripture tells us in verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning. And again, we see that couple, the couple of faith and obedience, faith and obedience. Our faith is not truly tested until we come to a place where we have to obey. 
And it is only when we obey, our obedience certifies and solidifies our faith. And so this is what happens here to Abraham. So he gets up in the morning. He does what he has to do. He says nothing to no one. He says to Isaac, let us go. And we are going to Mount Moriah. And we are going to worship God. Watch at verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? We will remember in scripture when God spoke concerning Abraham. And he said, I know that Abraham will teach his sons to do right. And what we observe here is the lad had been trained to worship. The lad had been trained to offer sacrifice. He had trained this boy. And so the lad is realizing we are going to offer sacrifice. So this is nothing new. This is what my dad and I, we are accustomed to doing. And so dad, what's happening? We usually will take the sacrifice along with us. Where is the sacrifice? And in verse 8, Abram says, my son, God, will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Again, you see Isaac. Isaac is definitely a picture of Jesus, that sense of submission, that sense of obedience, that sense of humility. You know, he doesn't rile up. He doesn't, you know, his father says God will provide and God will provide. Verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, and he placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and he laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, again, we see God, Jesus in Theophany here, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering. Hallelujah. So we see here, God had given to Abraham the ultimate test, and Abraham passed the test. He obeyed God. He did everything God wanted him to do. But at the end of the day, God showed up. All God was doing is testing this man's heart to see the extent of his love. And you know, ever so often, God is going to test our hearts. Ever so often, God is going to put us in a place where he wants to know if it's only talk or if it really comes from the heart or worship to him. And so the scripture moves on to tell us that at that point in time, let me just go back a bit here. Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply your descendant. So God is reaffirming and confirming the covenant that he had entered into with Abraham. He said, as the stars of the heaven and as of the sand of the seashore, and your descendant shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So the blessing to Abraham was hinged on Abraham's obedience to the voice of the Lord. And then the scripture tells us in the last three verses of that chapter, it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham saying, indeed, Milcah also has born children to your brother Nahor. And so the scripture just gives us a little peep here as to what's happening over back in Ur of the Chaldees with Nahor. And that's important because later on, we will see that when Abraham was ready to get a wife for Isaac, he sent his servant back to Ur of the Chaldees 
to his family, to Nahor's household, so that he could get a wife for Isaac. So we move on to chapter 23. And in chapter 23, what do we have here? We have the death of Sarah. We are told here that Sarah dies at age 127. She is the only woman in scripture where her age is recorded. And I guess because she's the mother of nations, we see where we have her age recorded in scripture. No other woman had that privilege. Isaac is now about 37 years old. And Abraham is going to purchase a piece of property to bury his wife. Let's look at verse 2. So Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So God brought them into their inheritance, and Sarah dies in that land. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before the dead and he spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me a property for a burial place among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Those are the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. And the story goes on that Abraham was willing to pay for this particular cave. It was called the cave of Machpelah. And he purchased that particular property. And it was good that he did that because we will see later on where they would bury him in that same cave. Look at verse 17. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth. So the first property that he legally and rightfully owned, it was like a down payment for everything else that God would give to him. So he paid for it, and the Bible tells us it was a big expanse because it was not just the cave of Machpelah, but all the land surrounding it with all the beautiful trees. And after this, verse 19, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, and that is Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as a what? as a property for a burial place. As we move on now in chapter 24, we will see where Sarah is now dead. Isaac is about 37 years old, and Abraham wants to ensure that Isaac gets a bride, and not just any bride. So let's look at 24, verses 1 to 3. Now, Abraham was old well advanced in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but you shall go to my country and to my family, and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to, to follow us. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. And I want you all to look at that phrase. It's a powerful phrase. I've never heard a message preached on it, but I think it's a good phrase to preach a message on. Abraham said, Do not take my son back there. Abraham knew where God had brought him from. Abraham knew that God had called him into a country and into a city where he was taking him and his descendants. Isaac was the promised seed. And so he says to his servant, now if you were to work out this particular servant, we do not have his name. But you'll remember earlier 
the servant that would have qualified to get everything that Abraham had, if he did not have Ishmael and Isaac, would have been his servant Eliezer, who was the oldest and who was the most senior. This is the very man that he's going to use, his trusted servant, to go to look for a bride for Isaac. I want you to look at also verse 8. If the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. Now, he said this twice. He said it with a sense of not just urgency, but a sense of conviction. He said, you know, servant, whatever you do, do not make the mistake and take my son and carry him back there to live in there. God has called us out. And I say that to say this, when you see God has called us out and he has laid his hands upon us and he has said to us, go forward. We do not go back there, back in the field, back in the mire, back in the mess that he has brought us from. Abraham knew what Earl of the call he gave. He knew what God had called him out of. He knew he did not want his son to have any part of that. So on two occasions, he said, do not take my son back there. And I challenge every child of God, don't go back there. You have inherited the promise. You are heirs of the kingdom. You are forward ever, backward never. Don't go back there. Amen. And so the story goes on that the servant went, as we would see here, to the area where Neho and his family was. But as you look at the servant, you will see that this servant embraced the very faith of Abraham. Hear what it, it tells us here. So the servant, verse, verse 9, the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and he swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's goods were in his hands. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nehu. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Now look at verse 14. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also be the one. She said, drink, let her be the one you have a Appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So here this servant sets down his own rules and he says, God, listen, this is the way I'm going, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I want you to do so that I would know that you have shown favor. And exactly what the servant required of God is exactly what happened. Rebecca comes, the scripture tells us in 15. It happened before he had even finished speaking that behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Neho, Abram's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. Not only did she do that, but she did exactly what the servant asked the Lord. She blessed all the camels. She fed them. She, she gave them water. She took care of them, everything that he required. And when he recognized that she had done this, he said, oh, my goodness, this has to be the young lady. And, and there's a scripture also that I want to bring out. He said in verse 14, let her be the one you have appointed. I want you to pay attention to that word appointed so that Rebecca was not no ordinary one of the crowd. Rebecca had been appointed by God for Isaac. And I want us to know that God is still appointing people for others to bring them together 
to fulfill his purpose. God has an appointed someone for you. God has someone in mind for you. So she was appointed. And as the scripture says in verse 18, so she said, drink my Lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished, she fed all the camels. And the Bible tells us in light of that, what did he do? Scripture tells us he put a nose ring on her nose based on the culture at that time. And he also put a bracelet on her hand. And then they entered into conversation and he realizes she is indeed from Abraham's, Abraham's father's house, the house of Neho. And the scripture tells us here, so in verse 28, so the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. So I want to stop long enough to talk about Laban because we meet him again a little bit later as we move on. So she had a brother named Laban and Laban ran out to the man by the well. And it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist. And when he heard the words of his sisters, Rebecca saying, thus the man spoke to me that he went to the man and there he stood by the camels at the well. And so Laban was like that big brother, you know? And so he was the one that took the initiative. He was the one that welcomed him in. He was the one that ex um, extended the hospitality. And so the scripture tells us that they welcomed him in. They gave him hospitality. They allowed him to lodge. Him. And then he was a little bit busy and he made it clear to them, listen, I, I cannot stay here too long. I am about my, my master's business. And um, as much as you guys would want me to stay, I want to take my master's son bride for him. And so the story continues until eventually they asked Rebecca, are you ready to go? Or do you want to wait a little while? Rebecca was all set and ready. And the scripture tells us as we come to the end of 24 that they blessed their sister. Look at um, verse 59. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, so Rebecca got a blessing. And amazingly, look at this blessing coming from Laban. All right. Hear what he says. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. Now, remember, in this time, they did not have millions. And so they will have thousands and tens of thousands. You will see it even in the New Te Testament when um, they speak in Jude concerning when the Lord comes with his saints and he comes with 10,000s of his saints because that's as far as they knew at that point in time. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. And the Bible tells us she left with her maids and with her, her nurse and her maids and they came back to the land as they were coming the scripture tells us as we come to the end of the chapter that Isaac had gone out to meditate. Remember, he had lost his mom and he would go by in the evening time and meditate. And as he was out in the field, she asked a question. Let's look at 63. Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening and he lifted his eyes and looked. And there the camels were coming. His heart was beating. Then Rebecca lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servants, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So immediately that kind of respect and purity this says, so she took a veil and she covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and he took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. Could we have love at first sight? Sure. God's appointment, when God makes an appointment, he has already put all the synergies in place. And this is what happened here. The moment Isaac looked upon Rebecca. 
He loved her, the Bible said. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Amen. So we move on now to chapter 25. And as we look at chapter 25, we will see that Abram, look at verse 1. Abram again took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bore Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian. Oh my goodness. This old man who was past age, who could not have a child because he was so old. God had so rejuvenated him that even Isaac, you could tell me about our God and the way he blesses and he does some marvelous things. Here Sarah is that. At this stage of life, where Abraham going? But the Bible tells us he got another wife, and the man was bringing forth sons. And out of this group of sons, this is where we get the Midianites. And they also rose up to be another challenge to Israel. All right, so he took a wife. Her name was Keturah, and so he had many sons by her. But the Bible tells us in verse 5, and Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. So here he gives them gifts as they're growing up and he keeps sending them away because he knew very well that this child was the child of promise. And it says in verse 7, this is the sum of the years of Abram's life, Abraham's life. I'm so used to saying Abram, I have to get used to Abraham. The sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years years. So after he had um, Isaac at age 100, Abraham lived 75 more years. God just renewed this man's youth and he lengthened his days. Then he breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. And this is where we hear about Ishmael again, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite. So we would remember that is where his wife was buried. And it says, the field which Abraham had purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt in Beer Le High Roy. Beer Le High Roy. Now, as we look at Isaac here coming down to the end of, of chapter 25, we will see where he settled in the wells of La High Roy. And if you look at Isaac, Isaac was a totally different kind of person. We heard a lot about Abraham. We will hear a lot about Jacob uh, shortly. But Isaac was more, you know, sedentary, very humble-spirited, very quiet. We do not really hear much of him. Whatever you read of him, you will read of him digging wells, and you would read of him just being out there in the plains. And this was the kind of life that he lived. So we want to move on. And it says here, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian Sarah's maid servant, bore to Abraham. So from verse 12 all the way to verse 18, we have the genealogy of Ishmael. And then Ishmael moves off the scene again. And then we come right back again to Isaac. This is the genealogy, verse 19, of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac, and he was 40 years old 
when he took Rebecca as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. So this is where we know that that particular lineage from the line of Neho and Laban, they were the Syrians. 21, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the scripture tells us that as she conceived, there were twins in her stomach. There was a fighting and a warring on the inside. And the Bible tells us that the Lord said to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. And we are going to stop right there because the story continues with much excitement. Let's bow our hearts today. Father, we once again thank you because your word is so rich and there is so much we can learn from your word. And even as we come to this, this point, Lord, we pray that you will continue to teach us, continue to, to show us truths in your word that can guide us. And Lord, even in this situation here, we saw where Isaac entreated of you and Lord, you heard his prayer and you allowed his wife to bring forth a twin. And so we bless the people of God as we continue to walk in obedience to your word and as we walk in faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you.